And what's up, everyone? How are you? Welcome to Play Hard and Love Big Radio. My name is Nick Clark, and I am your host for today's show. An excellent show, I might add. Listen all the way to the end. Play Hard and Love Big Radio is dedicated to bringing you people and inspirational stories that help uplift you to become the most amazing version of yourself. Play Hard and Love Big Radio is the official podcast of Spotted Dog Yoga and Sup Shop based out of Folsom, California. If you want some awesome yoga and community connection, check out Spotted Dog Yoga at spotteddogyoga.com. All right, y'all. I've got a really special guest for you today. She's a great friend of mine, and she's an original Spotted Dog. She's an OG, Nikki Evers. Nikki Evers is a team lead for the Delia Real Estate Group here in El Dorado Hills. We're in Folsom, but up in El Dorado Hills. And she has been in the area for a very long time, raising kids, selling houses, making a huge difference in the world. And I'm super, super excited to have her. Nikki, thank you for being a part of the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you are actually in the studio. How does it feel to be in the studio right now? Uh, I love it here. I love this. This is my happy place. So I was excited that I get to sit here and talk to you from uh, Folsom. Yeah, it's a great place. You know, what's interesting about that studio space is that um, right outside, like if you if you were looking forward, right, the parking lot's out there and there's a lot of energy and <laughs> some would even maybe even say chaos. Like there's a lot of like stuff going on. People are moving and grooving. But then right when you walk in the door and, sh and shut the doors to Spotted Dog Yoga, it's pretty serene in there, isn't it? Very quiet. I love it. I don't think I've ever been in here without a whole class of people, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is really cool. And yeah, it changes when there's a lot of people in there too. The vibe just turns right on up. And it's because of great people like Nikki. And um, if you all are watching the video uh, version of this, which you can see on YouTube or on Spotify, right over Nikki's shoulder, over her right shoulder, all the way to the back above the back door there, there's a bunch of pictures on the wall. And those pictures were taken just over 10 years ago when we opened Spotted Dog Yoga. And the lady right in front of you or the lady you're listening to right here, Nikki, she's in those pictures. I mean, that's pretty amazing. You're a part of our original photo shoot at Spotted Dog Yoga. How has your life changed since you started coming to Spotted Dog Yoga 10 years ago? Just in general, how has it changed? You know, I was thinking about this earlier today. Um, you know, I think back when I first started going to Spotted Dog, I, I was in a place in my life where I wasn't allowing myself the permission to be curious and to explore and to love more freely and to be open. I think that I was kind of stuck in a little box and I, you know, we put ourselves in that box and I really did. I put myself in this box to be, I guess, more pleasing to people around me and thinking that, you know, if I had to be this certain way in order to be, you know, acceptable and you get to a point where you kind of felt like, I felt like I was in a prison, like for a long time. And right around that time, I look at those pictures and I remember I was desperately getting to a point where I was like, I got to break out of this and, and I need to figure out how I can give myself permission to just be who I'm supposed to be um, and open myself up to more possibilities because I did, I felt really limited at that time. So coming here is like over 10 years, you know, I can document coming into class and knowing where I was and leaving, getting a lot more out of it over time because I was allowing myself to just let go and surrender to what was being presented in front of me and not being afraid of doing that. So yeah, it's been, it's been a journey. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Well, and now let's talk about where you are today. Um, you're a team lead for a very successful real estate group mm -hmm. and selling homes and building people um, and just being a leader in the community. And then also you're growing and preserving and you're fermenting food. Like you're doing things just like you're doing things for yourself and you're doing things for the community. So let's talk about your leadership role right now in the real estate, in your real estate group. How's that going? What are you learning from it and what's working for you? Oh my gosh. Well, 
I, first of all, I'm partnered with an amazing uh, partner. His name's Sean Delia, and he has created a culture within our team. Real estate is is has been kind of always like everybody has to do things a certain way and this is how it's supposed to look. And what I love is that we, he's kind of taken that and said, it doesn't have to be that way. And we can be um, collaborative and we can share, we can uh, support one another, you know, lift each other up. And what happens in doing so is we've actually grown as a team much bigger than I think we would have if everybody was going, well, I'm not going to share how I got this business because then you're going to take this away from me. And I think some cultures within other brokerages kind of do that. And it hinders a lot of the growth that is possible within each person on a team. And so that's been my absolute favorite thing. Um, and of course, I love when somebody's new and they're, you know, they don't know all the things that, you know, I've gathered over 26 years of being in the business. I love just coming alongside them and like, okay, what, what do we need to do? Like what, where are your fears? How can I help you step through that and um, pick up the phone and call this person? This is what I'll sit with you. And you know, the, it's almost like the, the lightness that they feel once they've stepped into something that makes them feel a little uncomfortable. And then they step into it and realize, oh my gosh, I've, I've done it. I'm growing, you know, I'm, I'm learning. And it's just, for me, I just love being a part of that and watching my younger agents or the agents that are new, newer licensed, um, become successful. Like that's, that's what I get up in the morning to do. It's not about me buying and selling homes for people. It's about more about them and watching them grow and, you know, and, and the obstacles that we face, we all can commiserate together. And that's the thing. They're not alone we're all together and it's kind of cool. Like when something happens, all, you know, 16 of us can come together and have a laugh over it and go, oh my gosh, this, this has happened to me before, you know, and, and it makes everybody just feel so much lighter about, you know, doing their job and loving it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, learning any kind of a new skill, uh, learning a new job requires stepping into a space of being uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And when you have someone of experience like you that can be there to share your experiences, but in, to do it with each other in a lightened way um, makes it so much easier. And I imagine that keeps people in the game a lot longer too. You know what I mean? It, like, cause otherwise people get like stressed out or overwhelmed and then they don't want to do it anymore. You know, they're like, this isn't for me. Right. Yeah. Burnout is a real thing. And I think when you're doing it on your own, it's so easy to get burnout. Um, and, and feeling like an island, you know, you're, you're in the trenches, but there's nobody there that has your back or, um, can help you, you know, feel better about a situation or, or even learn from it. You know, sometimes you go, okay, well, this happened. Um, maybe next time this is how it probably should have been done differently. And then you move on from that. You learn from all the experiences, whether it's a failure or a success. And when you're by yourself, then you have all the self-talk telling you, right, I'm not good enough. I screwed up and, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Everybody else looks like they have it together and they're so much better than me. And it's like, you can, you can quiet those voices if you have other people that are there to pick you up and support you. So that's right. I do definitely think a team is so important. Oh my goodness. Yeah, totally. You know what? It's interesting because it's spotted dog yoga. One of the things that we teach is that in order, like in order to get present, come out here come out into the space, come and be with people and get out of being in your head, get out of being inside, you know? And I think a lot of times people think of yoga as like really like connecting to yourself and there is that element of it. But I think that the most, from my experience, the most important thing that I've learned through this practice of yoga is that actually I connect to myself in a bigger, more expansive way when I actually come out Mm -hmm. And I'm with people and I'm with experiences and I'm with life. And when I'm in my head, like you're saying, it actually takes away from my experience of life. I don't enjoy it as much. I feel like I'm hard on myself. Like I don't feel like I'm doing good enough. All those things, you know, yeah. um, I was, uh, this is perfect because it leads into the question that I wanted to cover with you in the conversation. We're already having it, but just for all of you that, that are going to want to connect with Nikki after this podcast. Um, those of you that just want to connect with her, like 
to for positive vibes, or maybe some of you know somebody who has a home that they want to sell in the area, um, and you want to be a connected to like an a, a outstanding professional realtor. Um, one of the ways that you can connect to her is through her Instagram account. And then the other way is through her Facebook account. So you just look up Nikki Evers. It's N-I-K-K-I-E-V-E-R-S, Nikki Evers. And the reason I bring that up is because if you look on her Instagram page, which is really professional and sharp, by the way, I love what you're doing there. Um, at the very top, she says that what her purpose is, and I love that, make friends, love and serve people. That's my purpose. And I think you probably all are getting that from the conversation right now. But my question for you, Nikki, and let's just continue moving it forward is how to communicate and listen and develop relationships and friendships from the perspective of being in service, right? Your purpose is to love and serve people. So how do you use service as a way to develop relationships and friendships? Well, I think, and you know, it ebbs and flows. First of all, like sometimes you just, I think it's about having the capacity to be able to be open to other people's needs in some way, um, not being an enabler or anything like that. But I think that once, once we've kind of given ourselves the freedom to just be in the moment and be who we are and be grateful, like I think gratitude is a huge part of that then you've let go of all your stuff, right? And then you can walk into a room and feed off the energy of other people, but in a, such a, in a way that I can give to them. If I have too much I'm holding on to, I don't have anything to give to anybody else. And so I do think that, you know, having a, a practice or something that can help you to release a lot of your stuff and, and just be in the moment and be okay with wherever you are um, opens you up to then having experiences with other people. And even though I might have the ability to say like, I want to help other people. I want to serve you. What do you need? Um, I get so much more out of it. It's not about, um, just getting up and doing all these tasks for other people. Like that's not what I mean by serving. It's more, you know, in the moment, um, what do I have that can possibly feed you? What do I have that can, that can add to your experience of standing in front of me right now. And then in doing so, even with kind of more curiosity, I'm opening myself up and wanting to know all of those things about the people around me. And then they give a lot back to me. And I think that that creates that, that relationship and, and actually just being in a place of just like, Hey, I, I want to, I just want to be a part of whatever you're doing right now. And, whatever that is. And it could be a two minute conversation and it could be like an hour long dinner or something. But, um, but I think, yeah, just once you release a lot of the things within you, as far as the things that you hold on to that keep you from moving forward or um, opening yourself up to other people, that's where you can sit back and just listen and just mm. take in what other people have then to turn around and serve you with what they have. I mean, that's, what I do believe God kind of puts in front of us. Like we can't ignore why we have people in our life or why things come and go. It's because there's a purpose for all of that. And we would be denying ourselves some amazing experiences and relationships if we just kind of kept our little blinders on and went through our day. You know what I mean? Yeah. It is like, um, makes me think about what you were saying earlier, what we were talking about earlier, like getting out of your head and being present so that you can listen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like um, doing that. I don't want to say, I don't know if selfish is the right word, but it almost is a selfish approach to life to train yourself to be in your head all the time. And it is like, it is a trained way of being, you know, when we constantly are feeding ourselves thoughts and believing in those thoughts, we're training ourselves to disconnect from what's really happening in front of us. And what I'm hearing you say, and I love is that it's like, well, you have to have, you have to train yourself and have practices to help clear that stuff out, clear those thoughts out. You have to have teams to clear those thoughts out so that you can actually like be an open, clear space for people to share and so that you can listen to them. And then when you do, like people really do open up, don't they? It's amazing. Yeah. 
And I will say, you know, having surrounding yourself with the right people. I think that, you know, I had to kind of do a little bit of an edit over the last 10 years when I realized, you know, there's people that are not feeding, feeding me with what I need to be able to do that. Right. There's people that kind of maybe Um, have more of a negative energy or they want you to feel the way they feel or where they're at. They want you to be there and they don't want you to grow and expand from, from that. And so when, you know, I always think like, if I can't be like a total goofy, you know, nerdy person about whatever I'm kind of really excited about today, if I can't be that, you know, that with the people around me, then maybe I need to question like, why are these people here? Because they're not, they're not going to allow me to, to be that nerd that I want to be right now. And so, you know, having like my partner, my husband is amazing and I can go to him with anything and not get the, what are you talking about? Or I don't know, that sounds expensive, <laughs> you know, whatever, or that that's going to take a lot of your time. Are you sure you want to do that? It's always like, all right, like find out more stuff about that. That's kind of cool. And that's where, you know, it's given me the capacity to be able to do a lot of the things I'm doing now because I've chosen to surround myself around people that were going to embrace a lot of that and be, that supportive person instead of the person saying, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. It's a huge part of it. Yeah. It's interesting how we like naturally will edit our way of being around certain people. Yeah. Like it's just a natural, it's like a protective mechanism. We just do like we're around certain people we have, we understand their energy. And then all of a sudden they're like goofy fun personality is no longer yeah. even close to in the picture. But then like when you're around somebody else that's open, like you are, and I'm talking to you, it's so easy to just like be me and not worry about what you think, because I just know you're cool with me. Right. Yeah. And I'm, that's really, that's huge. And you know what I found too, and I'm interested in your perspective of this too, is I found that in building teams of people that if someone doesn't fit into the team, like if their energy isn't like that, they kind of, they, they kind of weed themselves out. Have you figured, have you found that too? Yeah, uh, definitely. And, you know, and, and when we build our team out, we have a prospective person to come join our team. You know, we ask ourselves, you know, do they fit the culture? Do they, are they collaborative? Are they a share a giving person? Um, do they celebrate when other people are successful or do they, you know, maybe get upset about it or somehow, you know, it's like there's, there, there has to be a space for that in our group. And if not, then, you know, you know, I'm always happy to help them find their place, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's a careful selection. And sometimes we've had, it really hasn't happened very often to be honest. I think we've had really only one person that has left the team that didn't, you know, they kind of weeded themselves out. And, um, but for the most part, I think we we're pretty good at vetting, you know, the energy and, and just the culture of that person, if they're going to fit within our culture, um, you have to be generous. Yeah. 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 You have to fit the culture and it's cool too, because everybody at different parts of their lives kind of find like that place where they mesh into certain cultures, you know? So if there's some person that doesn't fit the culture, say it's spotted dog yoga and it's maybe it's just, it's not that anything with them, it's just maybe their timing where they are in their life. Like it just doesn't fit for them, you know, Absolutely. 10 years down the road, it may, you know, yeah, well, like things always about, are constantly like shifting and changing. Totally. And I mean, think about who, you know, if, I mean, I'm 51 years old. So when I think about who I was even 20 years ago or 30 years ago, my gosh, I wouldn't have fit in this culture. <laughs> I was not that person. You know, I was still figuring out mm-hmm. who I was and where do I fit in this world? And I was, you know, trying to achieve everything. And I was, you know, I probably stepped on people to get to where I was wanting to go. I wasn't the person I wanted to be, but I didn't even know how to get there. And I think, again, it's like just letting people into your life that are going to support um, growth and curious. My favorite word is curiosity. I mean, just being curious to go, you know, how can I, you know, grow this? How can I, you know, or how can I have more of this experience? You know, something that 
fills you up. It's like, oh my gosh, be a seeker always. And don't let anyone keep you from that, that journey. You know, it's always a journey and, and don't beat yourself up for who you were 10 years ago, five years ago, even, you know, keep moving forward on that journey and being that person that you're created to be and with your talents and your gifts, which is lovely and wonderful to have us all have these different talents and gifts, you know, just because, you know, maybe I can speak in front of people or whatever. Somebody may not be able to speak in front of somebody, but oh my gosh, you sit in a room with them for 10 minutes. You're probably, and you're open to whatever they have to offer. That's what we need to do is to, to not look for what somebody isn't is to look for what, what, you know, what is your gift and what is your purpose here? And can, you know, can we like all tap into each other in that way, you know? Yeah. It's like, if you, if you are looking at someone expecting them to be a certain way based off of your experience in life or based off my experience in life, again, that goes to like, that's, it's a mental construct that's keeping you from actually like seeing the value of the per person that's right in front of you. You have like the open space, you're clear, you're coming from service. Like you do, Nikki, it's like you get in a room with people and everybody's different. Everybody has their different strengths and everyone can succeed yeah. because you, you really though, I, you're really the conduit for allowing those people to share themselves in an authentic way that makes a difference for that team or for the community, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I've been that leader too. I think about, you know, 15 years ago, I was the leader that was all, I was all about myself. I wasn't, I say I was a leader. I wasn't even a leader. I was an individual posing as a leader. Right. But it was all about myself and I wasn't open enough to hear what other people were saying. I wasn't open enough to see the different strengths that other people had and what it was. It was limiting me and limiting me in my growth, obviously. Right. Like as a professional, but personally was limiting me in my growth and understanding of how the world works. Yeah. So we are not all the same. <laughs> no, you know, reason. it's a weird, weird, limiting way to look at it that we're all the same. We're not, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, something that I know you're really passionate about and I want to get into before we close this podcast up is you're, you're growing and you're preserving and you're fermenting of food. I feel like this is something that you've been passionate about for quite a while, but you've really started to get into it yeah. in the last few years here. Can you talk about how that, um, that curiosity around growing your own food and sustainability has developed into what it is right now? Yeah. Um, gosh, I would say a lot of it started, I think that I've always wanted to be healthy and I've always kind of lived a healthy lifestyle. I grew up, my parents had a big garden and we ate from the garden and my mom was very health conscious. We, you know, I didn't eat fast food or anything like that. Growing up, we made our own thing. My mom was a great cook too. And she knew how to put food together and, you know, it was always delicious and I loved it. So I didn't grow up eating like a lot of processed food and stuff like that anyway. But, um, but, you know, through conveniences and, and as I was having my kids, I realized that, um, you know, I was relying on a lot of those conveniences for my family and, you know, running to the store and buying things that were kind of pre-made and throwing it together and, or going to, you know, a rest a fast food restaurant and grabbing lunch for my little kids when I was trying to, move. I did loans before. So I was trying to move loans around from lenders and they came with me in the SUV and I was just throwing chicken nuggets in the back to them. And, <laughs> and that's how <laughs> we were getting by, you know, and I didn't think a lot of it. I didn't really think about the food or that, you know, what was in it. I thought, well, this is a chicken nuggets, chicken, right? So I became aware. Right. Yeah. I became aware. I, well, I watched a documentary that kind of started me thinking about food and how our food industry, you know, is hurting a lot of people and making people sick and, um, and mainly to the meat industry with my family, they had a cattle ranch. So I grew up eating grass fed, grass finished food. And that was normal to me, but I didn't realize that the stuff you have on the shelf in the grocery store wasn't the same. So, um, after that documentary, of course, I started going down that rabbit hole. Uh, but I got sick. I started to get sick around when I turned 40. Um, I used to be able to eat whatever I wanted and I ran marathons. I was big in endurance sports and never had any 
issues physically or with stomach problems or anything. And I started to get really sick and I didn't like going to the doctor and they would just like prescribe Prilosec or they would say, um, I don't know, you know, could be this, could be that. There was no answer. And they just kept trying to throw pills at me. And I just deep down in my core felt like this is not, this is not the solution. This is not, this is not going to be my end. I'm not going to sit here and just take pills and say, this is how it's supposed to be. So I started doing a lot of research and, and the more I dug, the more I was like, you know, it's like you get that analysis paralysis. I just felt like, oh my gosh, there's so much I didn't know about the food that I was eating, thinking that I'm eating something healthy and, you know, it's crops made with glyphosate all over it. Like our food was just covered in chemicals. And, um, you know, I'm thinking I'm eating this healthy strawberry and I take a bite and I'm actually putting horrible chemicals in my body. And, um, and I started to realize too, that my body started to not recognize a lot of the food I was eating. So it, I would think I'm eating something that's, you know, put together at a factory probably, and I'm putting it in my body. Well, my body would go like, this isn't real food. Like I'm not, I'm not recognizing this as nutrient dense food that's going to help, you know, this body. So my digestion really started to suffer from that. And so, um, after a few, maybe about a year of getting up in the middle of the night, being really sick, um, I thought I can't live like this. I need to figure this out. So I did, I went down to a really whole food type of a diet where I literally didn't eat anything that I didn't put together myself. Um, and I cut out, I cut out flour, I cut out like wheat and that kind of thing, because it was such a highly, um, uh, genetically modified crop, same with corn and some other things, which they've gotten better. Now they're really trying to start to, you know, help our, our crops and you just have to know where it's coming from. But I had to eliminate a lot of that stuff. When you say they, when you say they, who, like the people, the farmers or the, who's getting better? Just, well, like a lot, I think some of the food industry, a lot of the farmers, so, um, there's a farmer's footprint is a organization that Zach, Dr. Zach Bush has put together to help farmers, um, get away from the subsidies from the government or from the, um, chemical companies like glyphosate. Um, they have been heavily subsidized so that they're kind of forced into continuing those farming practices, which is killing our soil. And so, um, there's these great organizations out there that are trying to help farmers to get out of that subsidy, that subsidy, um, type of farming so that they can create, go back to farming in the way that, that it's intended, which is rotation of crops, uh, cover crops, you know, to help our soil rejuvenate itself. And then, you know we have more nutrient dense food. We don't have food that's, you know, coming from Chile that is not even har it's harvested and it's not even ripe yet. And they spray it with some chemicals so that it turns it the right color and, har and it'll ripen, but it doesn't have the nutrients that it would be if you just grew a bell pepper in your garden during season, you know, or get it from a farmer's market in season, then that's going to be more nutrient dense, nutrient dense food. So anyway, went down a lot of rabbit holes and I could talk about this for 10 hours, but, uh, but it got down to where I started to go to farmer's markets only for, and I knew who the farmers were and I knew how they grew the food and I would get, and I, you know, if I wanted flour, I milled it myself and I would get it from a, a company that I knew were growing wheat in the way that wheat is supposed to be grown. And so, you know, I, I kind of had to do all of that. And it was such a great um, gift, I think, to me because it put me in relationship to my food. Like I didn't just go through a drive through and grab a bag and then eat it in my car while I'm driving, which is a lot of people are doing that because they don't have, you know, it takes a long time to, to turn that ship, right. To go like, you don't just overnight say, I'm not going to eat like that anymore. It's really hard to do that in the fast lives that we all live. And so I just over like probably a good 12 year period is where I've really gotten to where I'm, I, I make it my number one priority is to find out more about our food industry and what, you know, what I can do myself to help, you know, eat the food that is, you know, going to be nutrient to my body is going to not poison me <laughs> um, and help me to be healthier and healthier and, and do it all naturally so that I'm not going to need pharmaceuticals, hopefully when I turn 60 to 70 or whatever. Um, you know, my heart's going to be healthy. 
my lungs are going to be healthy. My muscles are going to be healthy. So that's, that's really the whole purpose of this. So I now live out on 10 acres. I have a 1600 square foot garden and um, I grow a lot of food <laughs> um, and I have chickens. I have my little chicken eggs and I love those. That's the most best eggs ever. Um, oh. But one of the things is I want to try to eat food that's always grown in season. So that's where the fermenting and the canning came in because I want mm. all my tomatoes to be harvested in the summer, have it in a can in my pantry or a jar, and then I can use it throughout the winter in recipes and do that. And um, same with fermenting peppers. Peppers, bell peppers have about three times the amount of vitamin C of, as an orange. And I know who knew if you ferment it, it has 12 times the amount of vitamin C. So it Whoa. heightens the nutritional value of the food. And then you can, I can keep these peppers for two or three years in the refrigerator in a jar after it's been fermented and then use that in soups and chilies and whatever else I'd want to cook with bell peppers. And so, and it's delicious. So good. Ugh. Yeah. Lots more flavor. So I'm experimenting with garlic right now. I want to ferment garlic, which is going to be a lot of work, but I figure, you know, you can hold on to garlic for a long time and it's going to have this really yummy flavor. And so, yeah, I need a lot of refrigerator space for this. But. <laughs> <laughs> or like a cell, you know, a cellar. My grandmother had a cellar. Yeah. I want to do that. I live in a, I live in a geodesic dome house. Oh. And it's really funky, but downstairs on the bottom level, it's really cool in the summer. It stays really nice and cool. So I would like to build kind of a cellar in this one kind of a utility room, but that's, you know, another project. I've got lots of ideas of things that I want to do, but. I love how, I love how curious and passionate you are about that. And also like, I think for sustainability purposes, mm -hmm. it's so important for people to think about the value of having food prepared and ready for them so that they could take care of themselves if something went wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I don't even really, I mean, I just like to have the knowledge that I have and that's where doing all of this and going through that process does help a lot. Um, but you know, I don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed. Like this has been a long journey for me to get to this point. But if anybody was wondering, you know, what can I do to make, you know, healthy choices or to take the next steps of sustainability. It's support your local um, farmers market farmers. Uh, they, you know, this is stuff that's grown locally here. Um, you can talk to them about how they grow the food and um, they don't use pesticides. And I mean, we we're so lucky to live in, you know, where we live or in this, you know, area where we don't have frozen totally frozen winters. I mean, we can have a longer growing period. So, um, so yeah, yeah you're gonna, you're gonna find that these things can be in season a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, go to the farmer's market, like get to know these people. They're, they're fascinating. Like mushroom farmers are oh. pretty cool. Like I want to start growing mushrooms. I'm like, that's one thing would be super cool. It's, but you know, these guys are pros and it's not easy. And so I love going and, you know, getting my mushrooms from them and, so it's, it's mm -hmm. fascinating, but that's, that's a great way to directly connect with your food. Just get connected and intentional. Yeah, that's so good, Nikki. That's awesome. I'm so glad that you provided those tips there because, you know, I think of people that were in your shoes or that are in the shoes that you were in, they're rushing around trying to get their kids places, trying to survive and make an income. And I'm, and I know that the, those people want to be healthy and I know that they want to be healthy for themselves and for their families. And so right there, you hear it, y'all, you got to go to the farmer's market, support the farmer's market. And then if someone was going to start like a little garden or, you know, do something small, like what would your tip be for them to start up something small, you know, at their place? Like what YouTube's what would you say? <laughs> YouTube. <is amazing. laughs> yeah. I mean, there are so there many. You go. People, and that's the thing too, is like, I love the culture of people that they know what they're doing and then they want to share it with others. And that's where mm -hmm. a lot of these platforms are pretty cool because the, there's people who are so passionate about growing food or passionate about their flower garden, or they're passionate about cooking or whatever. You can find these people. And then if you connect with them, like start following them and then seeing what they're doing. But 
yeah, just there's a wonderful like Facebook communities for gardeners. Join some of those because then when anything goes wrong, you can go like take a picture of your leaf and go, what's on my leaf? What's wrong with my plant? And <laughs> all these experts that are just amazing. They're like, oh, this is what it is. And here's what you do. And you're like, oh, thank God. It's like having you know, a grandma and an aunt and all these people around you that know what they're doing. And you're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. So yeah, I, I think, you know, it makes such a difference, even just having one tomato plant and, you know, maybe having an herb garden. That's always fun. You can, you know, have mm -hmm. little herbs and make something, you know, in your kitchen with the herbs that you grow in your window. And um, it's just those little things of like, you know, putting your hands in the dirt and like, just being connected to life around you. That's kind of my, my whole thing. So I would say, yeah, I just go on, go on YouTube, find people on Facebook, join those communities. Um, I think there's Northern California garden, organic gardeners and all kinds of different ones. You just have to put in gardening and you'll like have a huge choice and then make it fun. Yeah. That's awesome. And <laughs> Make it fun. Get your kid, get your kids involved. Like we have a gardens, we have our gardens going here and our kids are out there like every morning, Owen waters the strawberries and he waters the blueberry bushes, you know, and then we, when we plant, like we do starter plants in the winter and then we plant the starter plants and Owen's out there like dirt all over himself, you know, and it's like, it's a family event, you know, yeah. and it's, I think a really great thing to pass on to generation too. So we don't want to lose. So that. awesome. No. Yeah. Wow. You're so awesome, Nikki. I appreciate so much you, that you took the time to be a part of Play Hard and Love Big Radio and um, that you've continued to stay connected with me and um, been a friend of mine um, for the last, I don't know, 12 years, 10, yeah. 12 years now. <laughs> and um, we're going to get to know each other even more now as you're getting ready for the Awaken Yoga Training Program. Are you excited about that? So excited. It's time. I've been wanting to do it for a long time. And, and I think the timing just came together for, for this. And yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah, that's a neat program. I and mean, every single person has ever gone through the programs that we do at Spotted Dog, they come out with just a more awakened view of the world. And um, wow, I'm excited for you because you are already awake. And so to think <laughs> of you being more awake is like, it, that's some exciting stuff right there. You're amazing. Um, hey, everyone, thanks for listening to Play Hard and Love Big Radio with my special, amazing guest, Nikki Evers. Again, if you want to get a hold of her, she is a team lead uh, for the realtor group, the real estate group, Delia, mm -hmm. um, up in El Dorado Hills. You can find her on Instagram or on Facebook. I'll put the links to her social media profiles in the description of the show so you can click on it. Um, Play Hard and Love Big Radio is dedicated to bringing you the people and the stories that inspire you to be the very best version of yourself. And Nikki, you definitely have done that for us today. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you. I, such a pleasure. Love you guys. Love you too. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>